Thursday, yeah, exactly. Not Friday morning, you know. So I think timing wise, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. everybody. Um, thanks for making it out to this chill working group room for the inaugural MOPS working group session. Uh, I think you're familiar with the note well and you should note it well. Um, all the usual um, conditions for participating in the IETF apply. Um, a couple of bits of administrivia. Um, Assuming there are no bashes to the agenda, we have blue sheets that are about ready to circulate, are circulating, Glenn? Um, that are about to circulate. Um, I understand that we are, in th that several people have a conflict with the TSV working group that's on at the same time, so I expect there will be people coming in and uh, going out for different agenda items in either working group uh, and we've noted that we should make sure not to collide with that working group going forward. Um, so there's that. But it also means that we have a Jabber scribe. Thank you, Aaron. Um, but we don't actually have a note taker at this point. Um, is there anybody willing to be a note taker for this session, please? Don't all volunteer at once. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, so, okay, great. Thank you very much. We can move on. Um, so are there any bashes to the agenda that's been posted for a week or so? So we not, moving on. Yeah, so this is um, our inaugural working group meeting. We have met several times before in multiple contexts in different guises. Um, so I just wanted to remind people of what our of what our charter says. There's a lot of soliciting of input here and regular updates. Um, so this is the general area of focus for this working group. Um, and what you're gonna what we're gonna talk about this morning has a lot to do with updates from various. Um, I'm actually supposed to stand on this pink thing if I'm.
much better. Um, now I can talk to the mic microphone stand. Um, so there will be a lot of uh, updates from other uh, from other areas, from other um, organizations. Um, one of the things that I want to do with this session, because it is a working group and um, and not just a conference session, um, is start to work out our mode of operation. Um, so I'm hoping that we will actually have some interactive discussion around some of the things that are presented um, in terms of, you know, ask questions about stuff that's being presented on work going on elsewhere. Um, we have one discussion of, uh, you know, an awareness raising with regards to an issue with streaming and quick. Um, we can have a discussion after that presentation about, you know, is there is there further follow on? What do we think about it? So on and so forth. So generally speaking, um, just all that to say that um, this really should be a, I'm, I'm hoping this will be an interactive session, notwithstanding the fact that it is Thursday morning after a very long week. Um, thankfully, it's not Friday morning after a very long week. Okay, all right. So unless there's any questions so far. Um, yeah, this is just, uh, a further note about my earlier point about what we're here to do. Our outputs are meant to be um, some documents, um, the presentations that get posted in proceedings for all to see, and also potentially some dispatch-like activities where we might refer people um, to other working groups. That last aspect I think will be particularly useful when we have people who you know, join our efforts from other organizations who may not know may not know where to go in the IETF or may not know where to take their work within the IETF. Um, so that's sort of the general context. And that's it for me. Um, so next up, um, Jake. Hi. I'm Jay Holland, and uh, I was going to give an update on the um, the uh, one document we have so far. Next slide. Okay. Uh, so the doc status, um, I think it went onto the milestones list when we first started the working group or something, but I don't think it's been adopted by the working group, um, and I'm not sure whether that counts as consensus or not. I guess probably not. Anyway, um, we probably should discuss that and make a decision. Uh, the some of the offline comments last time there were some there were several supportive comments of the general direction, uh, a few refinements, um, and a few people seem to indicate that it's it's not totally clear that that the doc is super useful. But um, I'm not sure whether that means that that uh, we should refine it until it's more useful or that. Uh, the general concept at all is is uh, it, not necessarily worth writing down. Um, so a little discussion on that would be lovely. Um, yeah, I uh, haven't actually touched it since since posting it uh, last time, but um, I do have uh, a few. Uh, there was some feedback from Ali, uh, so I have a few to dos to put in there. Um, and I think that the suggestion from uh, from Leslie that, that this is not a taxonomy, it's a uh, operational considerations for media streaming for from edges um, uh, indicates changing the name as we perhaps adopt it and, and put it forward. Um, and then there's the, I, I would say the kind of most there is some, a lot of the feedback I got is that there is one really good insight that it would be great to get in there somehow, which is the sort of mismatch between the capacity and the demand for like large scale events. And, um, you know, in the sense of presenting it with good archival value, uh, this is, these are the slides that I had last time. I think I've shown them a few times. It's, you know, just the, the, when you, when you take a kind of large scale number, actually we published a new number since then, I probably should have redone the math a little bit, so it would move up by, oh, we'll call it uh, 2.4 million instead. But the, this, the core insight is the same. Um, it's just that uh, when you take a sort of large scale provider, um, just the, the thing that they're able to do, uh, even, even a, a good size CDN is, um, it doesn't match the sort of 
real ca capacity to consume the popular things from the audience size. Uh, even with the demand we have today, and you know, it, it's not clear, depending which numbers you look at, uh, like how much worse it's getting and how much better it's getting at different times. So the best idea I have on how to capture this in a sort of, um, uh, you know, a, a, an insight that, that applies across time is maybe the trend line with the um, cumulated uh, annualized growth rate, rate or something. I'm not sure that's good. I would love suggestions on how to do it better. Um, and uh, just other uh, suggestions on what should or should not be in the stock would be very welcome. Uh, so that is my update. Do we have any questions, discussion, adoption calls that the chairs would like to perform, et cetera? Thank you, Jake. So um, maybe we can start with opinions on that last point about what is an actual useful way to um, explain or articulate the demand versus capacity disconnect that you were describing in this graph. In, in a useful way that will be worth publishing for um, archival purposes. Kyle Rose, Akamai. Um, how about just uh, if you were to unicast all of this traffic, <laughs> how much bandwidth would that be? So I, I put a formula in there, um, one for how much it is uh, per, um, you know, per stream with with unicast and did a couple of example uh, example multiplications to say if you have this many millions of viewers it means this much bandwidth. Um, it it doesn't really make that point in a, in as punchy a way as the as the mismatch does, right? It just presents the raw number that oh, if you have half a million users, you need you know six hundred gigabits, which may or may not be easy, you know in two years time, but, or today, it's just the, the question of like, there is a mapping, but making the point that there is a mismatch and that the mismatch has been sort of growing and persistent and, and problematic is the part where I feel like it's, it's weak and could use a, an improved uh, presentation. In a way that, that still carries some punch Right, with recognition that that moving forward networks change. Right, that's that's like the part the part that I'm struggling to really communicate in the document. Uh, so this is the best idea I've got so far, but I think it could be improved, and and I'm looking for suggestions. Yeah, thank you. Mark Nottingham, cold. Um, uh, just thinking out loud, maybe it would help to kind of dive into where you think the constraints are. You know, like, you know, these are big numbers um, and, you know, but but the Internet has grown over time and, and, and CDN capacities have grown over time. Um, is it, you know, is it last mile? Probably not. I mean, at least where I live, everybody's getting 100 megabit and more pretty soon. You yeah. know, is is it middle mile? Maybe that's more interesting. Is it CPU? Is it is it network card? Is, is it the economics of your peering relationships? Yeah. The, you know, maybe just unpick those bits might help a little bit. That's a good point, thank you. Yeah, the, the in some cases it is the access networks. In a sense, it is inherently the kind of global provider in some kind of, you know, which may be multiple. Yeah, thank you, um, that's a good There's good another idea. dimension to this, which, you are? Uh, uh, Dave Oran, sorry, which be really useful to capture, which is that uh, people tend to assume there's a high correlation between the very high demand content and live content. Hmm. Um, uh, and to some extent, that's true if it's a football game or a rock concert or something like that. But there's other forms of very high demand content like newly released episodes on Netflix, mm -hmm. where pre-placement in caches clo very close to the edge tremendously ameliorates this, this bandwidth, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. unicast bandwidth need uh, without having to resort to you know the kind of multicast tricks we use that are needed for live, yep. uh, live content. Um, so yes. that's a second dimension to the problem. And I think it's really useful to capture somehow. Yeah, thank you. I, I was kind of 
bundling that under the live versus on demand comment that I got from Ali last time, but I think that's a, a helpful refinement. Thank you, Dave. Um, so Glendine from over here. Um, maybe even breaking up to two separate charts, one showing sort of the, the bandwidth requirements for um, file-based or highly cacheable content, um, and then a second one that's sort of more live oriented, because in particular for the live, uh, I, I think an additional parameter to try to start catching is latency as well, because with the because as we evaluate you know other approaches um, with highly cached content, latency isn't a big deal because if you're watching a movie and it takes five seconds or ten or twenty seconds from initiation to a scene, that's fine. But when you're in live content, since it tends to be sports oriented, latency is really critical, and and you can't do twenty seconds, you can't do thirty seconds, you need to get like you know two to six seconds. Yeah. Maybe trying to measure that. Um, and the other aspect I was going to suggest was. There's this other component here, which is that you get the adaptive bit rates coming into the equation. And so I'm not sure how to capture it, but I think it's important to recognize that um, these rates are, are variable even during a session. Um, and there's some ladder that, and so maybe it's, it's, a, it's yeah. to introduce a, a standardized ladder for sure. a lot of this content mm -hmm. and then uh, do the charting based upon the, the you know, because the ladder typically has yeah, okay, three so to five rates that you can choose from. Standardized ladder sounds out of scope for this talk to me, <laughs> but, uh, but fascinating idea. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I do have some text in there about uh, ABR that, that speaks a little bit to these points. I, I can't remember it off the top of my head now, but um, uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, I, will, I will review and, and see if that, addresses any of your comments. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm hearing engagement at least in this particular point and it sounds like it would take a bit of uh, document real estate to tease apart some of the possible approaches to answering it. So that sounds to me like there is interest in this document um, going forward and to your point about whether or not it's officially a, a working group document. Um, I think, I think, I don't know if I want to try a hum this early in the morning, but um, perhaps I should. Um, this, it is indeed, the document is indeed in kind of a strange state because it was adopted as one of the milestones as we went through the chartering process. Um, but on the other hand, we didn't have a formal working group discussion about whether or not we wanted to adopt it. Um, so I guess at this point, I would ask, I will ask for a hum. Um, are we in favor of uh, adopting Jake's document and uh, carrying on updates to carry out this discussion over the next, you know, month, sorry, months, 18 months, whatever, um, to try to tease apart and come up with good articulations of these things. So uh, in favor adopt of adopting the document, please hum now. Against adopting the document as a working group document, please hum now. All right, thank you all and thank you, Jake. So, so uh, what I heard was um, some hums in favor of adopting the, the document um, and a very little uh, disagreement with adopting it as a, yeah, yeah, could we sure, get a, and sorry Could we not. get maybe a hum for those who, how many have read it? <laughs> <laughs> Just comment from the job room, three, you got three hums in favor. Sorry? Three hums. There's three additional hums in favor. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, uh, anything else? Uh, Seeing no so, uh, Aaron Falk, uh, Akamai, uh, not speaking for Jabber, but for myself. Um, so uh, I confess I have not read the document, but the discussion I thought was uh, 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 caused me to think that there, uh, you know, uh, CDN based media delivery is a pretty mature area. There are uh, industry standard key performance metrics, mm -hmm. and I think to the extent that we can avoid. Um, reinventing those in a slightly different way, which will probably cause more confusion than it solves. It's probably a good thing. So um, I think it's probably a, a good thing to pull that information into this community, since maybe not everybody here is as familiar with those. But uh, I, uh, some of the discussion here seemed uh, like pretty well trod territory in the in the CDN land and so let's maybe we can find some citations that are good uh, good sources for that stuff but that I, sounds very useful if you happen to know any such citations please 
uh, send them along. I would I, very I think, much appreciate it. You can talk to our marketing department at Akamai. <laughs> Let's uh, let's keep it engineering, shall we? Yeah, so that's that's a that, that's a point well taken. Although I will also observe that part of the part, I mean, maybe that's exactly the right answer. And I'm certainly all for not reinventing something that's well well shaken out elsewhere. Um, as long as at the end of the day we wind up with something that will communicate to the IDF community something about the scale and scope of you know problems to be addressed. Right. It yeah, I, 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 yeah I wasn't trying to imply otherwise. I just think if uh, when we're doing something that if already exists somewhere else, we should probably just suck it in by pound Agreed. and include. I have a comment from the Jabber Room that I wanted to pass on. Chris Lemon says he's read the document. It's got room for improvement. Looks like it's going in a direction that will be useful. With Excellent. Chris. Oh, sorry. Uh, Scott Davis uh, also said, I proved it. I am pretty much aligned with Chris. So Great. two more thumbs up. Excellent. Thank you. Is this, this is on us. Um, Jake, are you looking for co-authors? Uh, if I have any volunteers for co-authors, I would absolutely love to offload some work. Yeah. I'll take that as a call. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, that would be lovely. Anybody who you know wants an RFC on their resume, this one looks like a, a, a good path forward. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. Thanks. So when I send to the mailing list that um, for confirmation that you know we're, we're adopting this as as a working group document, I will say that you you would be happy to have a co-author. Yes, thank you. Good. So everybody here can think about whether or not they want to help, um, and you'll have an opportunity to volunteer. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just a second, uh, Ronnie. Evan. I'm I'm doing the notes on the etherpad. So if anyone wants to. Okay, thank you, Ronnie. Yeah. So that it, it, the I didn't put the uh, URL to our etherpad in my slide deck, but it's on the agenda page anyway. Um, yeah. If if other people are able to join in on the etherpad and help Ronnie with the notes, that would be awesome. Okay, Warren suggests that we please save the etherpad every now and then in case it accidentally deletes itself. Okay, Sanjay, please. All right. Hello, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sanjay Mishra. Uh, I work at Verizon, but uh, I'm representing uh, as a member uh, of Streaming Video Alliance. So just giving a quick readout on uh, the Streaming Video Alliance's uh, lab initiative. OK. Uh, so the, the way I want to run the slides are just to give you a quick uh, word or two on what Streaming Video Alliance is, um, and the different working groups within the Streaming Video Alliance, and then kind of jump into the uh, SVA uh, Labs initiative as seen from one of the working groups implementation of it, um, and then some update on what we have done within the IETF. All right, so two things here. One is that uh, Streaming Video Alliance is really nothing but an ecosystem of uh, content providers, content distributors, um, ISPs, and the uh, network technology vendors working on over-the-top streaming media issues. Um, and by and large, the uh, alliance depends on IETF protocols pretty much for all aspects of streaming, uh, but also the fact that uh, the ecosystem provides a way for uh, companies with various degrees of expertise experience and exp expertise kind of uh, uh, work together and work jointly on issues and coming up with best practices or guidelines or in, in many cases specifications as well. Uh, and the next slide, um, just want to give you a warning. There's a lot of words here. Um, I guess the objective was to see how many words can fit into a slide. Uh, well, and uh, <laughs> so I think that got done, but obviously you can't read anything there. Um, so there are basically a lot of working groups within the um, Streaming Video Alliance. Uh, and just to call out just maybe one or two or three of you know, what the working groups are focusing on. So let's take an example of live streaming working group. 
They focus on issues like quality, latency, and scalability. Measurement group focuses on QoE. Uh, networking and transport working group focuses on uh, streaming at scale. Uh, privacy and protection group focuses on piracy and content protection, theft, uh, user privacy, etc. So there are various degrees of uh, work that goes on within each of these working groups. And they end up producing, um, as I said, um, various levels of documentation. Uh, best practices is, is one common thing, some specifications and also guidelines based on the experience in the industry. And in addition now, true to the IETF's mantra of running code, Alliance also works on specifications and APIs, uh, is actually doing a lot of work now to turn those uh, best practices and, and specifications specifically into APIs. Um, and they're doing that by establishing an open source platform. Uh, Alliance calls this an SVA Labs initiative. Uh, and I think the following slides gives you a little bit more in-depth view of what that is. So if you look at the SVA Labs from the streaming uh, working groups, the open caching working groups point of view, um, the open caching is, I don't know if it's, it's a fancy name, but it really is, is something uh, same as the concept within the CDNI, where you have an upstream CDN, which can be a commercial CDN or even a content provider, and you have a downstream CDN, which can be an ISP. So it, it really uh, is using uh, the CDNI RFCs in terms of how an upstream CDN can delegate content down to the downstream CDN in cases where it decides that that's the best path to do. Um, so open caching is really uh, leveraging CDNI RFCs. And the concept is very, very uh, similar. And uh, the, you have really three main pieces within the open caching architecture. What you have is the uh, control function that are within the upstream CDN, and you have the corresponding control functions within the downstream CDN. And then you have the open caching nodes, which are nothing but really uh, distributed caching uh, or CDN environment within the downstream. Uh, OCNs are what you see down below there uh, that are distributed through the uh, network footprint. Um, so it distributes the content easily. Um, and the uh, APIs basically connects all the dotted lines. Uh, so what we're doing is that uh, identifying all the key functions, um, laying out the APIs, and then we want to open source those and make them available for uh, make them available for industry for collaboration. Um, in addition to that, the working group is also has set up a test bed where we are testing um, features such as client stickiness. Um, what we have seen is that some of the media players don't always stick to the last redirected uh, source. Uh, so the behavior is not very consistent. So we've had some conversations previously in IETF on this, but uh, I don't think we had enough data that we could bring back to pinpoint exactly where the problem is, whether it's the standards or whether it's just the implementation of those standards where the inconsistency is. So what we're hoping to do is that run through our test bed, uh, generate enough data and, and learn from it and see if there's uh, any issues that point towards the standards, and if so, then we can bring it back to the IETF. Okay, and uh, just to kind of give an idea on what really open caching has done so far um, from the using the CDN, CDN RFCs, uh, really there are three, three major areas I would say that uh, we can uh, publish the APIs. Uh, one we would call as the service provisioning APIs, and these would be both directions coming in from the upstream CDN to the downstream and also in cases from, and then from downstream CDN functions down to the OCN. Uh, footprint and capacity is usually going up from the downstream CDN to the uh, upstream CDN, uh, providing the uh, footprint information so that the localization can happen easily. And then the content management APIs, these focus on uh, coming in from the upstream CDN to the downstream CDN specifically for managing the content down to the OCN level. Um, we also have APIs which we have not standardized them, um, either because uh, companies felt that some of this was just not uh, quite there yet. And in some cases, uh, these are very specific to, to features and functions. Um, logging is one such API, basically billing and performance related uh, APIs that we have. And then the capacity insight, which would be 
something that the downstream CDN can advertise to the upstream CDN so that they can figure out how to allocate content in future. Uh, so these are really the main APIs, functions that we have. Um, and the intent is to make these available through the open API um, with the hope that we will get a wider set of contributors also. Uh, these would be really restful APIs uh, and we plan to support in multiple languages. Um, so just to kind of bring all of that together, uh, the intent is that I think we have done enough work um, of, uh, in terms of where the technology is, and now that we have the information enough to publish the APIs, our hope is that this will increase adoption, also uh, encourage uh, collaboration from the industry, and uh, as we publish these APIs, one of the uh, core uh, benefit we also look at is that we can bring back the feedback into the IETF. Um, and we have done that uh, based on the open caching implementation. We've got a couple of RFCs that are uh, within the CDNI working group um, being, um, these, are, they've been, these have been accepted as the working group documents and they're just progressing through um, the uh, typical process of uh, working group evaluation. Um, I think with that said, that's all I have, um, and open for any questions. Great. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, I guess one starting question I have with regards to, you've outlined a lot of the work that's related to the CDNI work. Um, have you provided an update to the CDNI working group, or what's the status there? I mean, they don't seem to be meeting this week, but... Um, have you provided uh, in, so we're working closely within the, uh, so the documents that I uh, listed out. Um, so. Yeah, the, no, I, I realize that you're working with the CDNI work. What I'm, what I'm trying to get at is that this sort of provided an overview of how industry is using the existing standards. And it's, it strikes me that, you know, that presumably would be interesting directly to the CDNI working group, or maybe they're focused on the work that they're getting done and don't have time for these industry updates. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to well, just get a sense of whether or not. Uh, some of, uh, Kevin Ma from one of the co-chairs has been um, in the loop on what the SVA is doing, Streaming Video Alliance is doing, and he has provided some input and guidance as to how we should be looking at, you know, um, coming up with, right. with the work. So yeah, he's, he's given us some input and guidance. Right, so I, so then I guess my takeaway is from what you're saying is that this is a, a useful place, a useful venue for um, IETF in general to have an update on how the CDNI standards are being used in industry elsewhere without getting in the way of the actual CDNI work. Correct. Okay, um, so with that, Hi, Aaron Falk again, uh, minor comment. Could you take a look at the slide that's on the screen now? No, no, just go look at the screen, turn around, look up. Can you see the link? No. No, neither can I. <laughs> yeah, well, this is the sup supposedly a new uh, fonts that in the color screen that the SBA came up with. It, I really don't like it, and you just can't really read anything on it, so. Uh, yes. Yeah, per so perhaps you could send some feedback I, from the ITF yes, on. Uh, I, I take that feedback. Uh, thank so, you. So I've already given this feedback to them, but you know, certainly this is helpful. Yeah, I think you just got 30 more feedbacks. So, so, so yeah, I, I think we have a, a clear message from the ITF back to the SVA. Your template. Six <laughs> <Six fonts>, yes. <laughs> I didn't, I, um, those aren't my words. Uh, I do have a comment from the Jabber Room. Uh, Chris Lemon says, it's been a few meetings since the CDNI met, and the CDNI work is mostly proceeding on the list. Right. Yeah. Which makes sense. I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I don't want mops to get in the way of other other work. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions? All right. Thank you, Sanjay. All right. Thank you. Uh, hello. Hey, um, so Glenn Dean from Comcast Embassy Universal. Uh, wearing a different hat right now. So I, I uh, was a on the program committee for the recent uh, CIMTI 2019 uh, technical conference. Uh, it was a very interesting experience, and what I want to do is provide some feedback or some sharing of things I observed at that 
event uh, that I think are relevant to the ITF and will hopefully spark some interest and work here and some lessons. So for those who are unfamiliar with it, SIMT is essentially uh, a standards body that focuses on what they call professional content. Uh, typ typically uh, came out of the TV world, but it involves both production, uh, a lot of studios that don't do TV but do movies as well participate in SIMT. So it's really professional creation of content, professional distribution of content, uh, and that whole thing. Uh, one of the things they've been very engaged on for the last few years is uh, a change from an old transport protocol called SDI, which is what all the equipment in a studio historically was connected with, uh, into uh, things that are IP-based, which are very much using uh, or using ITF-based uh, technologies and, and protocols. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to bring back here, uh, observations of where that is right now. So it, that's clearly still ongoing. There's still a lot of studios out there in the world because they got to replace a lot of equipment that are still migrating to 2110. Um, and, and, and going on to IP networks. But a couple things that really came out of the, the conference that people were found interesting to talk about and really engage on microphones were the challenges of building IP networks for media. Uh, there were several people that gave talks on network architectures uh, that were designed entirely to allow for extremely high bandwidth, low latency connections between editing stations, editing bays, cameras, and recording devices and storage bays and clouds. Uh, it was, you know, a few of the things as a network guy made me cringe when I saw them because, you know, some people said, well, you don't want to build lovely multi-tiered hierarchical networks in your shop. You want to build one big giant flat network where everybody's on the same segment so you can get high bandwidth. Uh, it made me cringe. <laughs> uh, relevant to the ITF, there may be some guidance uh, work that we might want to draft some materials on for best practices of how to build such networks. And I realize that crosses a little bit in the operations thing. But we have the expertise here in this. So for future work in this group, that might be an area we want to sort of uh, tap into and, and, and play with. The second one was something which kind of surprised me, uh, even though I, I do live in this world, I didn't realize how much uh, focus people really had on time still. Uh, there was uh, numerous papers that talked about time uh, and the, this has been brought on because the old protocols uh, did carry time information around with them, and all the devices then were able to synchronize uh, and be, uh, you know, in, engaged and, and synchronizing their actions, but also when they blend content together in pieces, that all worked really well. Under IP, they lost that. And so one of the things they've been trying to figure out, 2110 did add in mechanisms for sharing time, uh, but the time sources are then becoming a, a problem. Uh, and so, you know, it's a complex environment. Uh, they heavily uh, have endorsed PTP, which uh, is a, a time standard, of course, if, you, if you're familiar with it. Um, there was other mechanisms, though. They didn't lock into only PTP. There's other ones that they are proposing discussing uh, because they have a lot of scenarios where they're offline or they, uh, one of the scenarios that was brought up was if you're trying to source uh, from GPS information and your GPSs all go down or your antennas are covered in snow, uh, you have a bit of a problem. How do you deal with that? It's some new work that they were trying to get other parties to take up. So likewise, there may be work here at the ITF where you may want to take up around time again. I, I, time is time. Time is coming again for time. Is there a question in the middle before I go on to the next point? Uh, Ronnie Evan, uh, I had I had similar question because people that were trying to transport the it depends how you transport the the media and they were trying to transport the media using RTP but use the GPS times then how to synchronize between the GPS times then how to convey it in in RTP because the precision is different of the of the information so right uh, so I think it's it's important because I mean again it will it will be good also for us to know. What, how do you caps, how the data is, how is the media is transported in order to figure out what we can do also here in other working group in order to, to help with, with this timing. It was mostly because they were sending the information from different sources and they want to, to combine them when in the, in the production area. And that's where the timing, and they were getting from the camera the GPS time with that. Yes. And, and uh, to add on to that, one of the uh, concerns that many people started raising was, uh, worries over security and integrity of time. Uh, because you know, if you imagine a lot of the stuff that's getting, you know, produced and streamed out live, if you start tinkering with the time, you can cause a lot of problems, uh, make screens go dark and cost people a lot of money. <laughs> or if, if you want to be really nefarious, 
you know, make some time go bad and then start inserting your own material uh, that's out of sync with it and cause a lot of sort of social activism, if you will. Aaron. I have a comment from the Jabber Room. Uh, Scott Davis says, time is everything in production. There are fine-grained time mechanisms and legacy productions that is critical to make the processes work. So I think he's agreeing with you. Um, do you have more? I have a comment, but I can wait till the end. No, I, this is my one slide. I, I, I have one final point on this one slide, and then... Oh, go ahead and make it. Okay. okay. Um, the one thing I got really excited about when I was sitting in this conference was the number of people started to mention IPv6. Historically, the, the you know professional media industry has not been a big supporter of v6, um, and I, people started talking about v6. I was like, yes! <laughs> so I just wanted to bring that back to the ITF. They're starting to listen to us, and, and they're getting on board, which is awesome. That's, that's great. Um, so uh, Aaron Falk, Akamai. Uh, I, this is uh, the time, well, let's see. There was another presentation that's actually been made in a few different forms this week on the ITUT uh, 2030 uh, vision of uh, you know IP of the future. First, I want to say it looks like SEMT has beaten them by looking at 2110. So that's great that uh, you know sort of getting a little further into the future. But uh, on a more serious note, uh, time actually appears on their list, and um, uh, one of the things that sort of uh, uh, um, uh, left me unsatisfied about the discussion there was it was more sort of a statement of we need better precision and here what this what I'm hearing here is that uh, we're actually running better precision in lots of different ways and and so the question that I have is what exactly are the problems and challenges that are coming out of this I think it would be actually really useful information for the IETF to understand like uh, what are the limitations? Where are things not working? So that we can actually talk about some potential work here. Uh, I, you know, this is one slide with a few bullets, so it's very high level. But I think that uh, this is a, uh, a very valid uh, um, uh, um, uh, activity for this working group is to try to bring in some of these challenges from operational areas on like where are the protocols were hitting some walls and what they can do, or there's too many solutions, or like the stuff that Roni was just measuring, uh, mentioning. And so I think if we could get some drafts on like, you know, hey, here's an industry situation where, you know, this is painful, that would be really helpful for the IETF to say, oh, well, here's an area where maybe we should apply some engineering. I agree with you. I, I fully agree that. I, I think specifically on around time, capturing some of their use cases, because they're thinking through them, Let's capture them and bring them over in here and get to work on it. Hi, Dave Oran again. Um, so uh, on the issue of time, um, historically the media industry and the networking industry have lived in completely separate bubbles, and we're seeing sort of the consequences of those bubbles evolving in parallel. But, but that may be entirely irrelevant uh, because the cloud data center people have created a third bubble, which is probably going to blow both of these bubbles away. Because, they, because most of the data center operators now have uh, sub-nanosecond atomic clock synchronization across their entire data centers. And they don't do it with either of the things we're talking about here. So it'd be really useful to spin them into this conversation because if you're going to run in one of those data centers, your problem basically evaporates because you have nanosecond scale time synchronization across the entire data center. That's a, point, that's a good point, Dave. I had not considered that. So if you're only worried about distribution, you're right. The, these groups are also worried about video production, and video production's running in, the, in, in data center style well, infrastructures. Are, okay. So, all right. But top point is look at what these guys are doing, because we can put atomic clocks almost anywhere now at reasonable cost. Well, and, and, and you know, there isn't going to be one single way people do this. It's a very diverse set of environments. It ranges from people doing field production in the jungle recording a movie, uh, two people connected to live networks, two people in stadiums uh, doing live streaming at low latency. So there, there's a lot of areas here to get really into different nets and, and different detail. All I'm saying is that the way the technology is going, it is reasonable to assume you can afford an atomic clock most places. But can you carry them on an airplane? <laughs> Pardon? Can, can you can you carry yes. them on an airplane? <laughs> yes. They'll go through they'll go through, they'll go through TSA. Awesome. Yes. You, you you may need to have it in a refrigerator in order to keep the temperature stable, though. 
Uh, so uh, going back to, to Jake's document, um, uh, I, again, I haven't looked at it, but does the taxonomy that he's looking at, it's mostly on the, is it mostly on the distribution side or is it also on the production side? It, it was primarily on the edge side rather than the, the, than the um, center. So I think that there's, um, yeah. So I think that the focus that I, I think it needs to have is, is, is more on the, you know, do we have the, the capacity or uh, looking at the capacity gap? Um, okay. Well, I think that you know, Glenn's raising a different set of questions yeah. on the production side, and so maybe a taxonomy document to help inform the IETF on like what do these environments really look at. You know, this is kind of like what TCPSAT did in the early days was to try to pull in some information on like you know what are the what's the variation in the in these environments to understand what I mean from a networking point of view. Hmm. Okay, so maybe uh, we can look forward to causing a draft to appear, and then next time we can discuss whether or not it's something we need to adopt. Good. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you, Glenn. Sorry, I got another comment from Jabber. Okay. See, that's what happens when I talk too much. Uh, Mike English says, even distribution spans, data centers, and networks, uh, time synchronization is still a concern in heterogeneous environments. So, yeah. All right, switching gears. Igor. Igor in the room. Here we are. All right, uh, I'm Igor Lubashev, Akamai, and my goal today is basically to bring some information to the people who were not, who are not following a quick working group uh, every moment, and to share some of the observations about what quick uh, will bring to the people who operate media streaming, who are responsible for quality of service, what kind of changes, some challenges uh, that. Uh, you'll encounter. Um, all right. So I, I'm probably preaching to the choir uh, when I say that uh, monitoring and troubleshooting network is important for quality of service, at least uh, to this group. Uh, but uh, it's basically that's what operators like to do on their network is to be able to see delay and loss and hopefully see it before their customers uh, call them and tell them about the problems that they're facing. Uh, when you are looking at TCP streams, uh, people have been traditionally looking at the sequence numbers and if a, symmetric, if a path is symmetric, X numbers, and you could put together uh, estimate of the loss and the estimate of the delay. Uh, quick, as people are aware, is a it's a pro protocol that's encrypting its headers. It's doing it for some very good reasons, including uh, security, uh, user privacy, especially in the world of uh, migrating uh, user age, uh, users who come from one network to another, and for uh, protocol classification reasons, which is basically trying to get the middle boxes to keep their hands away from parts of the protocol that they shouldn't be looking at. And now, uh, so one of the goals of Quick is to be able to evolve the protocol quickly. Now, one of the alternatives is, well, if you cannot see anything in Quick, there is no signal in it, uh, let's just observe similar TCP flows. Um, that actually works pretty well today because uh, Quick on the internet represents a single digit of traffic. Uh, I totally expect that once Quick Working Group publishes a spec and uh, there is a number of implementations, every single browser has one and every CDN will have an implementation, uh, there will be a step function in the amount of quick tra percentage of quick traffic on the internet. So we'll need to develop more viable uh, uh, more viable tools. And Spencer has a question. Um, Spencer Dawkins, um, two, th two things I wanted to mention. Thank you for bringing this work here, Igor. Um, I could be wrong about this, but to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time um, a chartered ops working group has talked about this issue. And I think it's been really important, speaking as the former area director of the spend bit. Um, 
Yep, right. you are jumping ahead to my last slide, but but yeah, that's I, I completely agree with you. Yes, excellent. On this on this slide, um, when you say just observe similar TCP flows is not a good answer. How bad is it? And you don't you don't have to answer, but I'm saying I think that's the engineering question right. that's going to really matter. So you know, as as this as this conversation goes forward. So I I love that we have actually extra time here. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to answer this uh, this question. So how bad is it? Um, I don't know whether it's really bad today, uh, but uh, the TCP and UDP have very different uh, treat, uh, get very different treatment by, by the network. It's actually not uncommon to have a network under a large UDP flood, and that's. Typically, I would assume because it's much easier to compromise a user space uh, application and send uh, spoof tra UDP traffic. And typically, networks, what they do is they police uh, rate limit uh, on the uh, UDP and their links. So you may immediately get very different performance from UDP application and from a TCP application. So observing TCP and UDP may actually diverge quite a bit. Uh, Bernard Boba Microsoft just wanted to make a comment that I, I think this may be assuming that uh, quick is used in some of the same manners that TCP is but what I'm seeing is is somewhat different streaming architectures being used with quick such as things like scalable video coding and one of the problems that introduced is introduces is that it's no longer sufficient to just know aggregate loss <clears throat> You really want to know the loss of each of the layers that are being transmitted. And that's something you can really only get from the end systems. Um, it's not really easy to observe that in, in transit, even if you have, uh, even if you were to do everything in the clear, um, you'd have to have the right RTP markings and observing all of that is kind of complex. So, um, and I would observe that we've created a whole bunch of new metrics on the sender and receive side that actually get you much more detailed loss data than you could possibly get through network observations. So just something to think about um, that, that this stuff isn't necessarily gonna be collected the way it used to be, that it may be collected at the app layer, not even at the, at the uh, endpoints. Right, I mean, definitely you cannot get everything you possibly want just by observing transport. I mean, that's, that's the same thing in TCP world and UDP world, that's absolutely true. Um, all right, so just a little bit of about, about uh, well, uh, media streaming right now is by far the biggest quick use case, so that's why it's, very, it's important for this uh, group. And me, uh, streaming is actually very sensitive to changes in round trip time and uh, to packet loss. Uh, now, so what is available um, so once quick basically removes all the implicit signals uh, from uh, the transport layer uh, there was there was work on putting back an explicit signal for delay measurement uh, it's a spin bit it is available it's uh, in quick version one i mean of course it's subject to uh, user agents actually supporting uh, turning it on but it is part of the standard and it works in a pretty simple way. Uh, you just have a server that's echoing back those bits as it received uh, from the last packet from the client, and clients uh, spinning the bit, basically flipping it to uh, the opposite value from the last packet uh, that they received from the server. And you could see an unpath observer can measure uh, round trip time in each direction. Uh, so you you can you can be in each either of the directions and you could measure the round trip time of connections. Um, it's using one of the uh, bits that were previously reserved. Uh, now it's dedicated for spin bit in quick uh, short header. So it's basically in the first byte, and there is a link to some more about it. Um, Loss bit, so the loss uh, loss rip, uh, signal is not going to be in quick version one. Um, that's mostly due to 
timing, uh, but uh, there are proposals to uh, how, how to do the loss measurement. And uh, there is a, a quick extension draft, or maybe there will be several, uh, that are actively in the works and will be available very soon, one of them from us, um, on mechanisms how to add uh, loss reporting. And the loss reporting goal is to be able to, first of all, observe that there is loss, quantify how much, and to be able to decide, uh, to determine whether it's upstream loss or downstream loss, which is very important when you try to actually troubleshoot the source of it. Uh, like with a spin bit, it's, uh, it would be using uh, reserve bits that are available in quick version one header. And right now there are two uh, drafts available for uh, slightly different but somewhat similar uh, methods of uh, measuring loss. Uh, they're all just uh, drafts on principle of operation. Um, so actually, since again, we have probably a couple minutes, um, I don't have a slide here. Uh, you could uh, read the draft or uh, look at a more extensive presentation uh, in Montreal and TSVWG. Uh, but so one of the operational principles for one of the proposals is essentially you have a square wave. So you have a uh, marking that alternates uh, every n packets. And by observing that, you could observe the upstream loss. And then you have a, another bit that's effectively driven by the protocol's loss detection machinery. Um, if a loss is of a packet is detected, it increments a counter, and if it sends out a packet, it marks if the counter is non-zero and decrements the counter. So basically, from that information, you can determine end-to-end um, -end loss, which is because it's what our protocol machinery determined. Now, knowing end-to-end -end loss and upstream loss, you can figure out everything else. So that's basically our proposals uh, mechanisms. There are others. Uh, and just before we close, uh, it's kind of a, I mean, for completeness, some people said, well, one way to determine loss in quick is to decrypt all those headers. So share the encryption keys with some trusted middle box and um, now you don't have a problem. Uh, there are lots of problems with that from security perspective, from privacy pr perspective, but if actually even from implementation perspective, uh, decrypting a whole ton of connections real time is hard. Uh, key distribution under lossy conditions uh, is hard and problematic and uh, just not a good idea. So basically, we have to have an explicit signal in the protocol to enable this kind of measurement. And so what do we want for the operators, for people who actually care about it, for people who think it's uh, observing loss is important to do? Number one thing is if you have a discussion happening around you, just speak up and say it's important. Uh, that's probably one of the main reasons, as Spencer said, that we're still here talking about experiments as opposed to another proposal already in version one, is that we haven't had a huge operator uh, presence in quick working group from the beginning, and so uh, we're here now. And of course, watch for quick, ex uh, quick extension drafts. Uh, that's, and then you, there are a number of links uh, for people who are interested in learning a lot more about everything we talked about. Thank you. Great, thank you. Questions? <laughs> yeah, uh, Spencer Dawkins, uh, Colin and I have finally used the spin bit to figure out who was gonna speak first. Um, so thank you, know, I say thank you for bringing this to the to the working groups, to the working group's attention. I love being able to say that about ops. Um, it, if I understood um, your point about about explicit signaling, um, you're is were you talking about involving the endpoints in that, or did you mean something else? 
yes, explicit signaling means that the sender of a packet put some signal that's explicitly meant for the path for a particular specific purpose, as opposed to what we have with many other protocols. Well, TCP is a great example where there are protocol machine, there is protocol machinery that observers try to latch on and uh, infer information. So um, I'm sure this happened many times before this, but the one I'm remembering is uh, the Marnu um, IAB workshop in 2015, where we were basically saying how will how will network operators understand what's happening to their networks? Same problem here, just different different operators, um, which is which sounds like a good thing. I've never understood how we were going to be able to do this without involving the uh, w w without involving the endpoints, and especially um, the interaction between what's in the quick invariants, so that basically you you could have network operations network operators that could consistently look at what they need across versions of quick. Um, versus being able to ever change anything because the point was that the very invariants aren't don't vary. So I think that I think that like I say I think that you're definitely headed in the right direction, and um, I I only wish we'd been smart enough to do that a couple of years ago uh, because I think you're definitely headed in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so as far as invariants, that is a great question. Quick is a pretty new thing that people have not had much experience with anything like it, especially on anything like the scale. So uh, the signals we're talking about are also quite new that many people, or nobody really, uh, nobody has any experience at scale. So all of these things are quite experimental and therefore that's why they're in version one. I can totally see if they take off as a one of the important means for people to monitor their network, then they're going to be deemed very, very useful and nobody will think of removing them from the future version of the protocol if there are no problems with them. Hi, uh, Colin Perkins. Um, so, Gori Fairhurst and I have a draft in the transport working group, um, which is talking about the effects of transport header encryption on um, sort of future transport protocol evolution. Uh, well, one of the things that talks about is the is the implications for network operations and management. Um, it's in last call in the TSVWG. Uh, it received a, um, a, a fair amount. It received a fair amount of feedback, uh, primarily from the security uh, related people. Um, it would be useful. I think if this community could also have looked at it and see if uh, it makes sense and if uh, people have uh, concerns or uh, um, c comments about, about what we're saying. Um, draft IETF TSV WG Transport Encrypt, I believe. Yeah, De definitely. It's a, it's a draft that inspired some of the work that uh, we're doing. I mean, this is actually putting bits specifically on the wire. Uh, that work was more general observation about uh, effect of encryption. James Grusing, BBC. Uh, I'm not the most knowledgeable on Quick, so if I get this wrong, somebody stop me. Uh, so one crazy idea is, is instead of having Quick doing affirmative ACK on port ranges, uh, switching it so we're doing negative ACK, which is what a lot of ARC-based protocols use, uh, and then use one of those reserve bits for the signaling uh, this would mean the client opts in to telling when there's loss in the network, but the details of how much needs to be retransmitted is still inside of the encrypted payload. Uh, I'm happy to talk to, uh, to you offline and to get the figure out, figure out the details. Uh, the general gist about just the overall of Quick is that it's trying to make sure that the only signals we put here are truly explicit uh, signals about this particular purpose. So if we try to marry a little bit of protocol machinery to be in the clear, it may be 
different. It, it, it may become difficult, but I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, Hi, Igor. Uh, Sanjay Mishra from Verizon. So I think this is really good. Um, and I was at the quick meeting uh, where the discussion did happen on this. And um, I know a lot of uh, operators didn't necessarily stood up to the mic to, to support it, but I think it's implicitly there. Um, uh, and, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of exhaustion also on, on the operators' part because they've stood up significantly and Mark can vouch for that. Uh, just to get spin bit uh, in the in quick, so I think it's not it's it's not lack of interest in this. There's a, a tremendous interest, um, and uh, certainly I think you, the point you made it's well taken. And you know I speak for Verizon, but I think other operators are also very equally interested in um, in having in seeing this work progress. So I think we'll we'll keep an eye on that and and provide comments and things as needed. Thank you. Thanks. Zahid, um, I'd like to take the comment a bit up level. Um, so I've heard like Barnett talking about like a lot of um, like loss information and other information metrics will be collected in the endpoints. And I also hear like um, you know, Spencer saying like, yeah, uh, how do you do without involving uh, endpoints, right? So I, so would it be, so I, would it be very unrealistic to think like in future? Um, uh, that we have more a collaborative client and network in place, uh, where basically a client is helping uh, the network with providing some information um, about this kind of metrics. They think like, well, I'm suffering, so maybe there is something that I cannot do on the server. Maybe something I share with the network, so network fix itself, something like that. And on that note, uh, there is also initiative uh, here um, is coming initiative on like mask uh, where you actually put some explicit proxy for quick traffic and stuff like that where you can have some kind of explicit channel which is basically authenticated and agreed on where you share some form of in information and uh, i think that that is another another thing that we might want to look at or more explicit more like a collaborative way of uh, solving the problem instead of uh, doing everyone does this best and nothing achieved. <laughs> so that's that would be uh, one way of looking at the problems. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally think that people will come up with very interesting ways of uh, solving problems. I mean, people are pretty creative around here. And uh, if you find clients and that are willing to talk to cooperating, uh, cooperating middle box and uh, there is some control plane communication happening that's helping performance or anything else, um, it will happen if it's useful and if cl clients find it useful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, I am Emile Stefan from Orange. And so with Igor, we ask at this slot because uh, network operation, uh, and monitoring is based on the observation of the delay on the packet loss. And we have been, uh, let's we'll say, fighting in the quick working group to get the spin bit, so to observe the delay. So on, so with the spin bit, uh, a non-pass device can observe the, the decomposition of the delay, let's say on the right, on the left, and know where is the, the, the big budget. <laughs> And so we are now asking to get the same thing for packet loss observation. And we are close to get something. And uh, that is, <laughs> I suppose, is going to be useful for media distribution. Right. So, uh, I mean, I wouldn't call it fighting, but there is definitely a quick working group is a collection of very sp spirited, high spirited, and opinionated people. So it's fun. Um, but Good things happen, uh, definitely. And uh, yeah, so like I said, uh, there, are, there is an extension draft that's going to be prepared. Mo uh, we'll try to get it in time for the quick interim. Uh, we'll definitely post it on the list. And we're more than welcome, actually, very, very welcome uh, feedback from the community, feedback on the technical stuff, feedback on the privacy implications or whatever people find that they really want to contribute about. Mauro Cocilio from Telecom Italia. 
As operators, we are very interested in this technology. We are the developer of the other alternative methodology, but we support this kind of measurement because in our opinion, packet loss and delay in explicit way is very important to monitor our network. It's not also important to monitor the application, but it's also important to monitor the network and in particular to segment the network in the many segments. Each segment, each segment is in the domain of each operator. So we want to distinguish the measurement to segment the network to understand where is the problem. So this kind of measurement in a specific way is very important in encrypted protocol. Great. This Thank is our, our opinion. So we support very much this kind of measurement. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, that's a common feedback that essentially what operators want is they want to be able to, if there is loss, for example, figure out where it's coming from and to just know whom to call. Um, Spencer Dawkins, um, I, I did not get up here to say this, but I can definitely con confirm that there was fighting in the quick working group about the spin bit. But more relevant probably to this discussion is um, the plus buff that we had in, in Berlin. Uh, that was a tussle of amazing proportions uh, to the point where we, you know, I made the decision not to charter a working group there, which was intended to provide visibility to on-path observers. So, I mean, it's like, you know, couldn't even charter the work. So the, the part where you're talking about on uh, about involving the endpoints with explicit signaling and is you know instead of distri distributing keys to uh, theoretically on path observers until the first day we do multi path quick, then the you know then they won't be anyway. But forget that. Uh, you, like I say, you, you have no idea how important what you're talking what you're proposing is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean the. The slide about distributing keys to unpath observers was mostly like just don't even think about it kind of thing. Um, right. Yeah, with regard to the exposure, exposure of the session key, I think it's a really, really a bad idea, especially for the interdomain troubleshooting. Nobody is going to share key of course. interdomain. This is really uh, important. On a more larger scope, I think with the spin bit, the quick working group is uh, enable, uh, uh, enabling a framework where hand to end points are exposing this, uh, information which is integrate, uh, which integrity is protected by hand to end. And this is something that the TSV working group uh, should think about. So encryption is not all the, the part you have. Integrity and encryption, and they should take care of both, not only encryption. Right, that's actually a very uh, valid point, that one of the things that you get from using quick headers and quick uh, protocol mechanisms is that you get uh, integrity protection uh, of, that, uh, of that signal. And as far as the endpoints are concerned, so by having endpoints engage in this, uh, it's giving endpoints a choice uh, to provide the signal. Uh, we hope that most of them will. Um, th all of the drafts for spin bit and for the loss bits involve a provision that uh, mostly they're about protocol, anti-protocol authentication, but also for privacy, that a small fraction of the traffic should not uh, have uh, the signal exposed. It's not going to compromise because it's very small problem, uh, portion of the traffic uh, ability to monitor it, but it will give additional protection against protocol authentication or some possible privacy implications for a minority of clients who may choose not to uh, expose the signal. So um, I'm conscious that we're sort of slipping into talking about the material and not just raising awareness. So uh, Colin, I'll give you the last comment on this and then we'll close this segment and close the session. Okay, thank you. Um, two, two quick comments. Um, the first is that in the conversational media world, uh, there's a fairly extensive um, endpoint reporting framework in 
at TCP. Uh, and cl clearly that's not directly relevant for this, but uh, there may be some inspiration that you can take from the things that have been done in that space. Um, the second is that if um, you're reporting on endpoint, you know, if you have endpoints reporting on the behavior of an encrypted protocol, um, there are some interesting questions about the integrity of that and whether the network can trust um, the, the reports to be accurate. Uh, and thinking about whether there are ways of um, somehow validating that the reports coming from the endpoints match what's actually going on um, may be useful. Yeah, that's a great that's question. A yep, uh, I know that Connex Working Group has done some work in that regard uh, previously. I mean, there are not enough bits for that, uh, but uh, that's a very valid point and uh, I mean, Theoretically, you could have uh, a TCP, malicious TCP uh, sender who is sending TCP packets that look like uh, gratuitous loss. Uh, so that's not an entirely new problem but, for that space, but, if, but, it's, if, but it's valid. If a TCP, if a TCP sender it, um, tries to manipulate whether it lost, you know, the, the information about whether it lost packets in terms of the X, it affects TC, TCP behavior. Right. If a quick receiver sending reports does the same thing. It doesn't affect the quick performance. True, true, correct. And that's the difference. Yep, that's true. Okay, so my takeaway is that uh, our awareness has been raised on this topic um, and that the work is being done, is currently being done in the uh, quick working group. So the action item for people here is to keep an eye on the work being done there and uh, contribute voices and opinions as appropriate. Um, and then I guess uh, if if further if further more co cohesive input is needed from people interested in video, we may at a future in a, at a future time decide to try to articulate video needs with with, with regards to this. Yes, Ronnie. Uh, just to be more precise, it's it's currently the, the, there's the work now in both in IPPM and Quick Working Group, and I assume that today in TSV area they will try to discuss where to do future quick work. So. For that, if people are interested in this work, they should uh, voice their opinion where it should be handled, mostly right. because of the overload of all these working groups. Right. Um, we're quite sure it shouldn't be done in this working group, so that's one off the list. Um, <laughs> right. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so now we've done one of these uh, MOPS working group meetings, and hopefully people have uh, a better sense of some of the type of things that we can discuss and you can be thinking of things that we should be you know we should be bringing to the table when we next meet um, so I will ask you to do that uh, if you're not on the MOPS working group mailing list you can certainly go ahead and join uh, and my last plea before we have a word from the area director is if you haven't signed the blue sheets please make sure you do before leaving Eric yeah Eric Vink responsibility for this group I'm quite happy with the first meeting they are at least the timing and the quick topic that are coming between the video cross area. So I'm quite happy with this. Good. But don't sleep it. on this, right? We need to continue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. Let's, let's keep, the, keep the momentum going. Uh, okay, so blue sheets are up here for anyone who needs them. Apart from that, go warm up. Thank you very much. And see you in Vancouver. <laughs> One thing I completely forgot to not mention though that we just submitted a new